Hello, welcome to another Toneless Landscape Oil Painting Demonstration. This is your painter in residence, M. Francis McCarthy, and the... Oh, welcome as well to the Mastering Georgia Ness series. I think it's day five. I'd have to verify that. Um, the painting I'm bringing you today, Study After Georgia Ness, is called Approaching Storm. My painting is an 8x12. I know very little about George's painting other than I have a, um, I, I found this image, my reference image, of course, um, six, seven years ago when I was doing the 100 Days of Tonalism. I haven't been able to find many copies of this image online at all, so um, there's that. But it's a kind of a quirky uh, image, really fascinating um, sky and very different composition. Several compositional things that I probably would never do. Um, mostly these the, these these trees right smack dab in the middle like that. Um, this painting is successful though. It does work. Um, and uh, I was really happy to do a study after it. So I, I, unfortunately I can't give you a lot of information about it. But if you go to my blog, the corresponding blog for this post, um, you will see a version of my reference image there. Um, and if you like, you can make your own study after it. Also, uh, the members area uh, will have the full-length video. It's about three hours on this one. And uh, where we go step-by-step. Step. And there's a, um, a color mixing session where I break the painting down into uh, what I thought were the most important constituent colors. And also talk a bit about my approach. Yeah. So um, other than that, this is a sped-up version of that video. So please enjoy it. Yeah. Um, in a little while, uh, probably around the six minute mark or so, uh, we're going to get back into reading from um, A History of American Tonalism, the chapter on George and S. Uh, we were on, uh, actually I switched to the the new um, edition. Um, we're on page 41 though, so we'll be, we'll be uh, reading that. And uh, George was, you know, foundational tonalist painter. You had Lafarge, you had Hunt, and you had a Ness, and these are the three guys that really forged the path for tonalism, uh, which tonalism is really an extension of the Barbizon movement of, of painting um, that was in France. Um, it's an extension of it, but it's not the same thing. Uh, there are a lot of times where I will do studies after Barbizon painters and just refer to it as tonalism because the differences can be um, not so great, but uh, one of the biggest differences is almost a spiritual difference. Um, there's, a, and I think it's because the American tonalism grew out of the Hudson River School, which is a very, very spiritual approach to painting and uh, sort of a reverence for God and how God was manifested in the landscape. Um, and that's one of the reasons why the Hudson River guys were called luminous, luminists because of this sort of special glowy light they would imbue their paintings with and also just amazing. I'm a big fan of the Hudson River School. Uh, it's not a way I would want to paint though. I'm not into um, lots of fiddly little details and I'm not into doing giant paintings or giant vistas or anything like that. Um, that predominantly is the uh, modus operandi of the Hudson River guys. Uh, but I sure do love that work, and I've seen some of it in real life at the uh, De Young Museum in San Francisco. It's absolutely astounding. Uh, Edward Church and all those guys are just just great. One of my favorite ones of those guys was Thomas Moran, who was kind of a he was a Hudson River School guy, but he was actually more than that. Um, he, yeah, he's incredible. Um, if you ever want to look into his work, that would be awesome. So. Um, let's talk about this painting. Well, the, the most interesting aspect is that stormy sky. Um, I used some purples. I have no idea what kind of purple that George and S would have had access to back in the, um, you know, 18. I'm guessing he painted this in the 1880s. That would be my guess. I'm fairly familiar with all his different modes of operation. Um, I have no idea what kind of purples were, but maybe it was a cobalt purple or something like that. I used the diazine purple, um, but you know, it you could you can't use that full strength. That's a modern pigment. It's so extremely bright. 
um, or chromatic I should say it's actually quite dark in tone until you add some white to it and you see it's like whoa it's off the I'm sure Ines would have loved that color and I'm sure he would have used it as I am also sure he would have loved colors like cadmium red um, I didn't use a lot of cadmium red in this mostly uh, let's see if I can help you out there um, a lot of ochre a lot of uh, burnt umber, a lot of brown ochre, which is one of my real favorite colors these days. In fact, I'm I'm trying to find ways to get myself um, some big tubes of brown ochre. You know, um, brown ochre is great because it's like semi-opaque, semi-transparent, um, and it's very much uh, it was very much running through this painting and um, a big part of my. Uh, uh, process here. The blue tones in the uh, painting itself, uh, I use phthalo. You could use almost any blue though because the phthalo had to meet up with some yellow. Um, in my case I used cad yellow. Um, now Ines would not have had access to cad yellow but he probably would have colors like oh geez I don't even know lemon yellow. I, I really don't know what uh, what sort of yellows the old guys had because most of the yellows I've worked with were modern pigments either like the acrylide yellow um, or the cadmium yellow. Um, uh, I definitely used a lot of yellow ochre, which he would have had. Yellow ochre being basically a clay, and it's quite a reasonable pigment. And humans have been painting with the ochres and the umbers for as long as there've been humans painting. Um, obviously, black. Um, the black I used in this painting was black spinel, just because I wanted to. Um, but I could have used any black. I could use lamp black or I could use ivory black or I could have probably even used Mars black. Yeah. Um, now the drawing itself was done with my new special mixture of brown ochre, raw umber and ivory black uh, which gives me like a, a more opaque version of raw umber. Um, and also with bringing that black it gives me some of the darkness I might want to but it was dry the next day to the touch so I did the drawing one day and I came in the next day and did the rest of my painting and uh, you know a bit of a challenge I was uh, under the gun time wise because I uh, kept getting uh, fractured with uh, other commitments but I was determined to bring you your Ines study this week I like to do what I say I'm going to do yeah anyway let's get into this book and read a little bit um, it's taken us a while. It's it's quite um, dense, but very well written by David A. Cleveland. And um, if you don't have a copy of History of American Tourism, go pick it up. You won't regret it. Okay, no artist invested the landscape with his metamorphic soul more fully than George Ines. According to his son, once in his Montclair or New York City studio, Ines's serenity and acuity of observation could turn into physical and mental anguish as he strove to interpret the vision that played in his mind and gave it life on canvas. When he painted, he painted at white heat, passionate, dynamic, in his force. I have seen him sometimes like a madman, stripped to the waist, perspiration rolling down like a mill race from his face, with some tremendous idea struggling for expression. After a picture was complete, it lost all value for him. He had no more interest in it. What was the masterpiece one day would be dishwater or twaddle the next. He would take a canvas before the paint was really dry and being seized with another inspiration would paint over it. I have known him to paint as many as half a dozen or more pictures on one canvas. In fact, as many as the canvas would hold. Inessa's biographer and fellow toneless painter Elliot Dangerfold wrote of Ines, the greatest of his pictures were painted out of what people fondly call his imagination, his memory, painted within the four walls of a room, away from and without reference to any particular nature, for he himself was nature. I want to get back to that, but we'll get to the rest of this, uh, this paragraph here. For he himself was nature, his eyes burned like a fire when in coal and red hot he looked through the blank canvas through the besmeared paint through the days and hours of work to that vision which was within himself and that alone was his goal and no likeness of any place or thing tempted him aside so that idea I've read that in this book um, many many years ago I've had I've had copies of this book since 2010 what a significant and beautiful idea you are nature we are nature we can access that as we paint nature 
I am myself am not that big on going out and painting in plein air. I think it's very valuable when if you're a painter starting out, I highly recommend you give it a try. Um, but for me, I like to I like to work with a bit of reference, you know. Um, but I like to take it and I like to do my own thing and um, in the controlled environment of my studio where I have access to all the colors I might need I have control over the lighting and I've taken consolation in that being a valid approach ever since I read that in this book uh, you know well, over 10 years ago now I am nature you are nature we are nature. We can paint nature without having to be slaves to nature because we're basically painting what we are. I think that's a great idea. Anyway, to keep uh, to keep going. I think I stopped in the middle of a paragraph. Like Emerson before him, and this was galvanized by Swede Swedenborgian ideas from the 1860s. Swedenborg was a philosopher and religious uh, theologist <clears throat> um, that uh, whose ideas that Ines subscribed to. Um, I don't know much about Swedenborgism, but I do know that Ines was into it. Yeah. What he found in nature was only the tantalizing simulacrum of the glorious spirit-filled landscape that existed beyond the visible spectrum of light. He was forever probing for the unseen, in a sense attempting to freeze-frame the metamorphic pulse of nature. This deeply mystical strain in his temperament found the artist in near constant agitation as he tried to peer <coughs> pardon me, behind the veil of reality to approximate some deeper truth. The truth harbored within the material world but not of it. He was continually frustrated by the difficulty of elucidating the valiance between objective reality and subjective vision through the medium of paint. Form, color, and anogalous tone, anogalous tone were for Ines a language unto themselves, not unlike the syntax of poetry. Melodic structure, rhythm, cadence, and harmonic unity often based in arcane mathematics constituted the scientific principles, at least in Anessa's mind, that he sought to impose on the facts of nature. And this, as Anessa told his son, he saw himself working the same line as the composer, composer and the poet. And just a bit about that, there's a whole book called Science and Landscape by Adrian Bell, I believe. Just put Science of Landscape and Ness uh, into your um, uh, Amazon search. Also, I believe there could be PDFs of that uh, gambling around the internet. Um, that book is all about uh, Ness's philosophy uh, and his mathematics. He came up with his compositions. It wasn't willy-nilly. He had um, what he considered to be a scientific approach. Unfortunately, I don't think that science made much sense to anyone else. Um, it certainly doesn't make much sense to me, but um, what I'm interested in is uh, I'm not fevered. I'm not a fevered person at all, um, and I don't honestly believe that I have to be fevered to capture something that is magical and has a mystical sort of significance. It has a spiritual resonance. Um, and that's really one of the hallmarks of tonalism. And, and getting back to what I was saying earlier, it's one of the hallmarks of the Hudson River School that came before it. It's like the tonalists kept the spiritual luminous quality, but they stripped away all the detail. They stripped away the giant vistas. They, they made everything more human scaled. Um, but the magic was still there, and the, the important thing, the, um, and a lot of the magic, it's easier, really, because instead of painting little bunches of leaves, um, you could just immerse yourself in the loose fracture of the brushwork, you know, um, which is what I endeavor to do when I make a study after a nest. And I should point out, um, if the color of my studies is a little different from the reference, it's in some cases it's just because I'm trying to lighten things a bit. 
anyway. Um, and, of course, I can't match him stroke for stroke. I go for the spirit of his work. Um, thank you for joining me today. I really appreciate it. You're seeing a little bit of the uh, the uh, real-time video at the end of the painting session. I'll be back with another Ness study next week, God willing. And please check out my uh, my some of my own paintings on the channel as well. Um, we're putting up two a week now. It's like clockwork. So if you'd like to buy this painting, go to my store. There'll be a link under the video. And until I see you again, uh, which will be real soon, I hope, take good care of yourself, your family, all your loved ones. Stay out of trouble, and God bless you and your family.